the Bad Brad Berkwood Show is all about moving humanity forward and fighting for democracy. And remember, folks, every act of kindness is a little love that we leave behind. Hey, folks, the man with the pinky ring and the New York thing. Forget about it. Bad Brad Berkwood. And welcome to the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report web TV channel. Forget about it. My guest today defines what my show is all about, moving humanity forward. She does that in many ways. She is an award-winning senior cyber information assurance analyst. She uses her personal experience being part of the LGBTQ community to help move the needle in accessibility and inclusion with a strong emphasis on making sure all voices are heard. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to my show, Hannah DeRimmer. All right, well, first of all, let's see. You're Okay, it's noon over there. Good afternoon to you, Hannah, and welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. I always start out my 360 conversations like this. We know that the internet is not always correct. So if I have something wrong in my notes, because I do a lot of research on my guests, say, hey, Brad, it's actually this. I'm not offended because I want my conversation to be as factually correct as they can be. Fair enough. Sounds okay. good. And All just right, a let's... quick visual description for anybody out there. Um, I'm a Caucasian uh, woman and I'm wearing, I have long brown hair, a uh, black jacket, and I have a white background. And then my pronouns are she, hers. Okay, good. And I, I would assume just in case anybody tries to take this and, and, and change it up, there you go. We, we've already said for the record, smart. There you go. Absolutely. Exactly. No problem at all. So let's start at the beginning. It looks like you were born and raised in Los Angeles, a city that Deb and I recently visited for a week. Would love to go back. Your weather is fantastic. Cost of living is ridiculous, but the, yes. everything else is wonderful. So if you would, talk about growing up in Los Angeles. It is different than growing up anywhere else, I can only imagine, and based on other people and me telling other people my story. So growing up in L.A. was unique and then also I think on a separate level because I came from an artistic family um, with a parent who's a public figure and you know that was very nor you know there was very normal for me a lot of our friends growing up their parents were also in entertainment so it, that's just kind of what I assumed was the norm um, and you know it wasn't really until I went to college that I got to see um, different perspectives um, I certainly had my struggles growing up in LA because it is, you know, very aesthetic. You have to look a certain way. You want to have a certain amount of money. And I recognize that as at a very, very young age. So um, by the time I was 18, I knew that I needed to go see something else because I felt that there was something else out there. I just hadn't seen it before. Um, but, you know, I loved growing up in an artistic family. Uh, I thought it was normal that everyone's holiday ended with a cabaret show, which <laughs> I learned was not normal when I went and uh, spent holidays with other people and noticed how quiet it was. Um, but we had all different types of people in our house, all different shapes, sizes, colors, gender, sexuality. So, um, which is such a gift because again, I didn't realize that other people didn't grow up that way. So it was a real culture shock. Anytime I've moved around and I have a bit of wanderlust. So I've lived in a couple places, but it's it's very different. And I um I always recommend to people that grow up here, you know, go away for college or or just take some time um to get away because this isn't what it's like in the rest of the world. Okay. It looks like you got your undergrad from Emerson College in Boston. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And for the viewers, what did you get your undergrad in? I got my undergrad in integrated marketing communications. Okay. Talk about that time in your life when you, now you're on to Boston, different change yeah. of weather, different accents. Everything is, is a complete opposite. Yes. It's completely different. So um, like I mentioned, when I was, you know, thinking about college and, you know, wh what I wanted to do next, I knew I wanted to see something else. A lot of, you know, the kids I went to school with, they stayed around here, um, or just California schools in general and have stayed here forever. But there were um, a couple of my friends and I just decided that we were going to go to Boston from LA, um, different schools, but it's, it's an incredible place 
in general, but especially if you're going for education, because almost everybody there is a student or a teacher. So, you know, for me, I looked at NYU, I looked at other schools, and I felt very lost. And whereas Boston feels like a more manageable New York to me. I got very comfortable on the subway. I was walking everywhere. Um, I met people whose parents were teachers and nurses and um, stay at home parents and, um, you know, just just all different types of people, like I said, that I knew were out there. Um, I I went there because it was still connected to media and film and music and everything like that. So, you know, it, it was a little bit comfortable. Um, but again, I wasn't sure if that was really my journey. Um, I remember before I went to college, my choir teacher said, whatever you do, don't fall in love when you first get there. Unfortunately for her, <laughs> everybody else, that's what happened. Um, I, I ended up falling in love. I joined, um, the Emerson Noteworthy Acapella Group. And that was really my life for those few years, you know, um, performing with the other schools there. Cause again, there's so many schools. Um, and I like to call it the Island of Misfit Toys huh. because it's kind of everyone who wanted to get away sort of ended up there. Um, you know, funky hair, funky clothes. Um, you know, our, we would have classes outside. I took audio design classes. I took classes at Berkeley. So it's, you know, it's interesting because it's a very strong liberal arts school, no math and science, which again, I was always really interested in, but since I didn't see that there was a way forward with it, I just kind of figured, all right, well, I don't think I'm interested in in front of the camera, but maybe I can be more involved in the business. So that's why I leaned a little bit into the the marketing world. But really my college was people and acapella. Okay. And I gotta ask you, going from LA to Boston, you froze your took us off. So how did you deal oh, with yes. the cold? Because it's yes. cold there. It's really cold. I think the coldest it got when I was there was 17. So that was uh very new. The wild thing about New England is how it can be snowing in the morning and then the sun is out by noon so that was always you know i just remember when we would like try to go shopping or something i mean you just have so many layers and things like that and um but you know what i loved it i actually like the cold i lived in the midwest for a while too and um i'm not i'm not like a summer kind of gal so you know i prefer everyone thinks i'm from new york Nobody believes that I'm from LA, but right. again, I mean, we are from New York. That is right, yeah, um, family, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's some we it's have our roots known. is in the Bronx. Exactly, exactly. I used to go to Fordham Road all the time. I was born in Westchester County. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, after that time, it looks like you moved back to LA, and yes. then went to the home of the iconic artist Prince, which was Minneapolis, for six years for yes. work. And is that correct? And for grad school. Yeah, for work in grad school, um, okay. that, you know, those were, were the eventual, uh, those ended up being, you know, some of the beautiful things that, that came out of it. It was definitely an interesting journey for me to um, end up in the Twin Cities. So my dad grew up there in, um, in the Twin Cities. So we grew up going there over, you know, to visit and things like that. And I always really enjoyed it. Slower pace. People were very nice. Everybody, you know, it's interesting, you know, when I, especially when I move other places and I come back, when I get off the airport in LA, you just notice the faces are a little fresher, <laughs> you know, whereas you go to, you know, the Minneapolis airport, just people are how they are because right, getting right. old is normal and bodies change. Um, so I, you know, unfortunately my, uh, my partner in college ended up getting sick and passed away. And right. so that sort of led me back to California. Cause you know, I made all these plans, you make plans and God laughs, right. I was planning on staying on the East coast. I was planning on going into marketing. Um, my partner wanted to be a stay at home dad. So we kind of had this plan. Um, and you know, unfortunately when, when, uh, he passed away, um, my grandmother also got sick <laughs> at the same time. So, um, so again, I had plans, but I just packed up my stuff and, and came back here. Um, and I was here for a while. I had a couple of, um, you know, big life events happen. I, you know, like I said, I lost my partner and then I lost my grandma, um, you know, my family, there was some 
addiction that we were trying to support people's recovery in. So there was a lot going on. And um, I, I've i always dealt with mental illness. I have struggled with it since I was a kid. And sort of after those sort of compound trauma sort of happening one after another, I really, I really got lost. And I really, um, I just wasn't really sure what was, what was left, what was out there for me. And uh, I ended up going to a facility to get help and uh, out here. And uh, it was the right idea. It was the wrong place. Uh, unfortunately, I came out sicker than I went in, which happens sometimes, and was um, very, very over-medicated. Um, and to the point where when I came out, I started, I developed something called tardive dyskinesia, whereas you're having tremors from being over-medicated. And, um, but we all thought maybe I was getting Parkinson's or something was going on. Okay. So I started seeing different doctors and they said, you cannot take this much medication. So I ended up going to the Midwest um, to another facility to help with that process of the detoxing off the meds and helping with, you know, depression and trauma and things like that. And, um, you know, we all kind of made the decision that it was not healthy for me to come back to LA. And Minneapolis has an incredible recovery community. And um, that's where we decided to go. And I ended up getting a job in IT, which I didn't even, I didn't even think I was that smart, to be honest. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I've been working in cybersecurity and IT. I ended up getting my MBA in IT. Um, during uh, the pandemic, and right, from, uh, from, from Western Governors Western Governors University, correct? Yes, okay. yes. So I was working full time in the Twin Cities, and I had um, just gotten out of a relationship. So I figured, if not now, when? And um, you know, my my company was um, has an opportunity to help with with um, tuition. So I took that opportunity. It was an online program. And um, I started in 2018 and I was supposed to graduate in 2020. We we're going to have a graduation, all these kind of things. But when the pandemic happened, um, that I, I just packed up and came right back to L.A. because we didn't know where the airport's going to shut down. Can I not get home? Right. So I just packed up and and left. And uh, we ended up just having a sweet little graduation in my brother's backyard. So, um, yeah. so yeah, all these things I never really thought I would do. And it's really cool. <laughs> okay. I'm going to read something we'll talk about on the other side. Yeah. I always like finding what I call a golden chestnut in my research for a guest coming on my show for a 360 conversation. I found one on you that I feel, uh, I found one when I saw you singing in quite well, might I add, on a video that was on YouTube of a song I believe that you wrote called There's a Girl. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So full disclosure for my viewers. Hannah's mom is a dear friend of mine, is a legendary singer-songwriter, Grammy Award winner, and Oscar-nominated Melissa Manchester, who I adore. So I was not surprised that you had a beautiful voice. I also saw, it was, I'm not saying you went totally theatrical, but I could see how it's in your family because your mom now is, is touring with Funny Girl. So I see yes. it's in your blood. So what I want to do is, I want first of all, I, I enjoyed the clip. For people that are watching this show, go type her name in on YouTube. There's two different clips. Of her yeah. singing the same song, it's like open mic or something. Really, really cool. And you have a, yeah. you have a beautiful voice. And I'm not just saying it to be saying it. That's just, that's mm -hmm. not me. What I want to do is talk about the singing part of your life, which you did kind of allude to earlier that you were, you know, you, you were in classes and your teacher told you not to fall in love. And you did right away. But talk about the singing part and where you've gone with that in a songwriting. Absolutely. So, you know, again, growing up in my family, um, you know, there was always singing around. Um, I, you know, at, at the time, it was very frustrating that my mom didn't always want us to listen to what was on the radio. Um, and so we were always listening to classical music. That was the only thing that was on in the car on the way to school and on the way back. My dad would sometimes play Steely Dan or um, Sting, things like that. But, um, but it was a lot of classical music. And of course, looking back on it, I think it really taught me to appreciate music, not just words, but music, sounds, 
Um, and these things that were created so long ago, before technology, before GarageBand, all of those things. And, um, you know, I started, I think the first song I learned how to sing, I must have been four or five, was Climb Every Mountain from Sound of Music. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Meet Me in St. Louis. Oh, Meet Judy Garland. Louis. Judy Garland. Yeah. Yes. So that's really what I grew up on was was musicals and musical theater. And, you know, it was very normal to sing in the car with my mom on the way to school. And my grandma would sing, my aunt sings every, you know, it's a lot of singing. So, um, you know, I started, I think my first solo role was in my fifth grade graduation of So Long Farewell. Um, And then I continued doing, you know, I continued doing musical theater and choir and jazz singing and things like that all throughout high school um and I and I definitely thought about it you know as as a potential future um but for me I crave stability and security and those are two things that are not very common in an artistic life and I had this conversation with my mom as well because I I I did have a couple of singing gigs and um You know, and she said something to the effect of, you know, unless you're willing to sit on the corner with a bucket out for change to sing. Knowing your mom. You you know that song, You Gotta Love the Life. That's where it came from. And knowing your mom, I just heard her say that because she's a straight shooter. I know that. Yeah, like you have to be willing to do anything for it. You have to wait tables. You have to do these things. You have to do all those things. And I experienced as a kid what it's like when things are really, really good in the biz. And things are not so good in the biz. And that was not something I wanted as a part of my journey. So I I loved the idea of, you know, getting home at the end of the day and then just having time with your family, having your weekends free. Um, but again, that was not something I really understood. You know, I remember when I was younger in school, I was so lucky that my parents and my family were at every game, every show, everything like that. And I would notice, especially if things were during the day, understandably, that people's parents wouldn't come. And I didn't understand that's because they had bosses and jobs, right? And so, um, so again, that was just something that, that felt better for me. Um, and, you know, once I finally had the opportunity to explore, um, you know, more of the the like math and science and, and engineering and all those kind of stuff. It was something that I sort of had been waiting to explore. But again, you know, um, my parents couldn't help me with homework. <laughs> you know, my mom was like, I remember I used to beg her to homeschool me. And she's like, who is going to teach you? It's not me. I can, I can teach you. You know, so. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think singing will always, always be a part of my life. And, you know, I still love to sing. Um, but, yeah, I don't think it was my my primary, my primary journey, like my mom and, and seeing her. It's kind of like, you know, I'm like, I know I have to be really good if I want to pursue this because my mom is so incredible. Yeah. And, um, you know, so to be able to su- support her in that way and see all those wonderful things she's doing and uh in terms of songwriting, yeah, when I went to when I went to college, I wanted to pursue more songwriting to see, you know, if I was good at it or anything like that. And uh, and um, you know, my partner Matt at the time, he was a musical director and and great at music theory and a guitar player and a drummer and and all of those things. And so he really sort of opened that opportunity to start writing together. And, uh, you know, and, and again, Emerson and, and sort of in Boston, there were open mics, there were acapella shows all the time, um, you know, weird theater stuff, but everything was just accepted there. You know, there wasn't really anything that you couldn't do creatively. So it was a wonderful opportunity. I remember one time Adam Gettle came in to hear me sing and I, I wasn't even a musical theater major. So it was, um, it was really wonderful and I hope to get back to it someday, but, um, but I, I leave that to my mom for now. Okay. All right. Well, like I told everybody watching, check out those clips. I, I enjoy yeah. it. And I like when the girl, the, one of the girls screamed for the crowd. We love you, Hannah. The open mic. I loved it. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see where we're at here. So you, all right. So you have over a decade of experience, including cybersecurity expertise in your current role. You were recognized as one of the top 100 women in security. WIS 
WISF Power 100. First of all, congratulations on that. Thank you. What I'd like to talk about is you do. You were a senior cyber information insurance analyst. And I believe when I was with Homeland Security, that was my last job that I did as a government yep. contractor program manager, that I worked, worked with some. It's been over a decade now, but I'm pretty sure we had some in the building. Talk sure. about that, what you do, what you can talk about as far as that. Absolutely. So, um, so what I do in cybersecurity is I work primarily with um, cybersecurity risk uh, when it comes to vendors. So anytime, oh, well, so how I got there, I, I started just working in a call center for the company uh, for IT support. And I will tell you the eight weeks of training was harder than my undergraduate degree. It was huh. just software and access and all of these things. And I just ended up doing really well at it. And um, I got into more major incident work where, you know, when there's big issues, if production is stopping, if nobody can get access to something, if we're losing millions every minute, um, I would sort of lead those initiatives. So I got really interested in security and, um, you know, I just, in general, like protect people, especially right now, there's a lot of people that need to be protected. And so I take that with me into my work, um, especially, you know, when we're, because um, sometimes it's just more IT related, but sometimes we're dealing with um, personal health information, we're dealing with um, social security numbers, you know, things like that. So we need to make sure that the security and privacy protocols are set up in a way that should there be a breach, um, we would not have that business impact. You know, for example, there was just the breach at the MGM, um, all different, you know, it's just people out there want, they want to take things and they want to use it for money. And so it's a really, really important, it's a uh, place to be in. So I'm, you know, I, I love the work. I love okay. the work. Well, again, congratulations on your 100 women. That, that's impressive. I was very impressed in that, with that. Thank you. You're welcome. You also work as a panelist and a consultant for a variety of affinity groups, including Medtronic's Pride Network and Ablet, or is it Able or Ablet? Ab Able. Able, okay. Able yes. Global. Talk about this, if you would. Absolutely. So uh, my, my personal passions are really accessibility, um, inclusion, equity, diversity, things along that line. And so I'm always trying to find a way to bring that, especially into corporate world, and in you know my personal personal world, so um, being a part of the Pride group at Medtronic, um, you know we do lots of work with um, you know gender education, um, family planning, um, healthcare, all these types of things, um, and also just have fun events. You know, have tables where we you know give out fun rainbow stuff, just so people. Um, know that even if they're in what they may see as a stuffy place or, you know, being in the Twin Cities is not the same as being in West Hollywood. So there were certain Junes that I would go to Target and say, where's your pride section? And they said, well, you know, we don't really, we don't really do that. Or can I bring in rainbow cupcakes in June? I don't know. It might make some people uncomfortable. Um, I don't care anymore. It's a cupcake. It's a hug. It's a um, a way for you to belong. And especially now, you know what I tell. You know, I find um, with a lot of our our cohorts around, um, you know, transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming. A lot of the people that I work with have children. And what I say to them is, if you don't know a trans person, your child does. And and you probably do. And there's a reason that person did not share that part mm -hmm. of themselves with you. Yep. So it's really, really, you know, they think it's, oh, it's just a young person thing. It's just a whatever. No, it's an everybody thing. Because again, you know, I grew up around all different types of people. I thought it was normal for, you know, men to marry women or men to marry men, women to be with women. I mean, just whatever. I just thought you kind of just did whatever really until I went to Emerson, which for a long time has been the safest college for LGBTQ students. Did I realize that that was not the case? You know, I had friends that had not come out yet going through that process with them um, or could not, or could not figure out how to, or, you know, and then just watch that journey from, before they came out to 
chapter and how beautiful that was. And, you know, I, you know, sometimes I struggle with the need to come out, right? Because I think if you just want to be who you are, and also coming out can be exhausting because you're constantly doing it. So my feeling sort of is if you grew up, if you grow up with around people with different learning abilities, hearing abilities, sight abilities, limb differences, um, kids in wheelchairs, then when we go and see that in the world, it's not this is an other. This is there over there. Right. And so that's what's really important to me because I don't know if if you know, some of the, the older guys I work with are very well versed in it. And I've had moments where I feel uncomfortable, but um, it's 2024, <laughs> you know, and it's a, it's a very scary time, I would say, to be in the community. Mm -hmm. I never experienced fear as a person in the community, I would say, until um, you know, cafe fe tangerine walked into the house mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, it's just so important, especially like in, in the corporate way, because I feel like for so long, it's been like, you know, you have your professional life and your personal life and that's not true, you know, and, you know, things like accommodations and asking for that, like, um, that should just be normal. That should not even be a question like, oh, I don't know if we, no. But if, but if everybody could just get what they needed, then it wouldn't have to be an accommodation. It wouldn't have to be this, oh, here's another thing. So, um, you know, it's, it's so important to do that work. And, you know, and in terms of, you know, the abled group, I, you know, I carry neurodiversity myself. And that's something that, um, again, I just thought I was dumb for a long time. I didn't understand that um, my brain was just not working the same way as my classmates. And, um, you know, and I've also, the past couple of years, I've been studying sign language um, with a queer deaf blind teacher. And that has broken my brain open. So oh, that's a combination. Ableism, autism, you know, the things that we learned in school. For example, when I learned about Alexander Graham Bell, it was, this is the most amazing, you know, genius. And he's creating the phones and all these things. Well, what I did not know is that he had a deaf wife and a deaf mother and started a school for the deaf where he refused to let the students sign. So, you know, I didn't even know that was a hot topic. And now I'm aware of that. And now, you know, I, I try and, you know, give visual descriptions. I try to, if I'm posting something, I try to post um, the transcript because I know now that a lot of people use screen readers um, if they have low to no vision, right? So just thinking about those things where for maybe whatever you consider normal or typical people experience, that's not the whole story. And unfortunately, many of these communities have been othered. I did not go to school with deaf people. I didn't know about interpreters. I did not know about American Sign Language. And um, especially when I was, when uh, my sister-in-law was bringing my niece into the world and learning so much about how sign language really helps with language comprehension and things like that. Um, it's just been a wonderful thing to do. So, you know, as somebody who is in the community and then also has um, mental health struggles and neurodiversity, it's really important for me to, to talk to other people who don't or people who do that are scared, you know, so that they know, oh, there's somebody who has a really cool job and she has ADD or, you know, like all of those things, because I didn't think that I could do the things that I've done because of the things I struggled with. I figured I would just probably be at home forever. I wasn't sure if I would be able to find a relationship or understand, you know, and now I have a master's degree. I have a big girl job. I got my place, <laughs> my dog um my car all those things so um it's just so important for me to like let everybody know that you can belong and you can find yourself and you don't have to change and if the people around you don't accept you or your job doesn't that's their problem you're in the wrong job and you're with the wrong people it's not you okay which i'm good the lgbt i want to segue in i'm going to read something to give you some context my viewers know this but for my newer viewers i want them to understand where i'm coming from so 
as you said, you're part of the LGBTQ community. Let me give you a little context, which is since this is the first time we're really sitting down and talking, my viewers and followers on Twitter know this very well. I've been a strong ally of the LGBTQ community for years now on my platform and show. It has brought personal attacks and death threats. And honestly, I don't give a fuck because I'm not going to stop being an ally of the community. I get called gay even though it says ally in my profile. I mean, you know, the, the two T, two brain cells MAGA cult, right. they, they can't even read that it. it says ally, but I don't care. No. So um, I, I refuse to let any human beings be attacked by rotten people who have the right. They have the right not to like the lifestyle. I'm not going to tell you what to like. But what they don't have the right to do and what I will not allow is to treat another human being less than because you don't like a lifestyle. Because mm -hmm. if you want to go on this whole philosophy of Jesus, he was very accepting of a lot of things that they're not accepting for. And right now, the LGBT community, especially uh, uh, transgender black women, are getting killed in disproportionate yes. numbers that you don't even hear about all the stories. First, it's because they're black and then throw them into the LGBTQ community of trans you hear about it even less. So mm -hmm. I have a problem with that. But with that said, my father before me, he fought for when it was lesbian and gay community in the 70s against Anita Bryant. Your mom knows about this. Yes. So I carry his activism torch. I take this very personal and I will always stand up for the LGBTQ community. Now with that said, I wanna ask you some questions in there, Hannah, and, and get your, your thoughts on this. First of all, you, you kind of alluded to this. In a society today that the LGBTQ community is under attack daily by the Republican Party and the insane MAGA cult of Trump, you kind of alluded to a little bit, have you faced discrimination, but you just said with the, the orange tint, whatever you said, the shot at him, that you feel it more now. I use Don Lemon, for example, when he used to be on CNN, and I never forgot this, and if I ever have Don on the show, I'll bring it up and you'll probably be surprised that I remember it. He said before, and we know he, he's African-American and we know he's gay. So he said before Trump, he could walk down the street because he lives in New York City. Now, he, now since then, he's married. And nobody bothered him. They may ask him for an autograph or they may talk to him. about it, But he would walk down the street and people would yell out their car, faggot, which they don't even say faggot anymore. That's how stupid these people are. They, 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 they're Neanderthals, regardless. But he said, but that started under Trump. So yes. you alluded to what started under Trump. First question on this topic is, have you seen personally, discrimination more towards you since Trump came down the gold elevator in 2015? I would say not me personally. I okay. would say not me personally. I recognize that I have a lot of privilege. Uh, privilege. I, you know, I'm Caucasian. I'm straight passing. I can code switch depending on the audience, whether, you know, I'm talking about a partner that was a woman or a partner that was a man. Um, and so I would not say that I specifically have faced any sort of discrimination. I will say though, even living in LA, I have struggled with, um, wearing pride pins or wearing, you know, things that I've gotten from conferences. Um, and I never experienced that before. I was, you know, when I was maybe 11 or 12 and I thought, oh, well, what if this happens to me or something? And I was a little scared. But again, I was so lucky that my parents were like, whoever you love, it's we're like, we're going to be good. So um, so for them, when I ended up falling in with a woman, they were like, all right, old news, tell us something new. Uh -huh. But yeah, so I was like, well, apparently I was the only one that was surprised here. Um, but, you know, when, when that, I remember falling asleep to Hillary in the lead in the Twin Cities. And I woke up and everything was different. And I, especially at that time, being in a queer relationship, um, I was terrified. I, you know, we had talked about maybe having a family in the future and all of these plans. And all of a sudden I, for the first time in my life, I did not know if that was going to affect everything. Um, you know, I, the way that it has, I mean, these these are not Christians. They're fascists. Mm -hmm. um, if Jesus walked uh, to their door and knocked on their door, they would pull out their gun that they mm -hmm. feel is important mm -hmm. and take him out. Yep. So, um, you know, I nobody, you know, we're, we're born to love and we're taught to hate. And I think that that is what Trump did is he taught he made America hate again. Mm hmm. 
And, um, you know, especially as somebody in the community and seeing um, these horrific murders on trans brothers and sisters, um, you know, or this fear around, I mean, a bathroom. I mean, seriously, yeah. like just let somebody release their natural biological urge in peace. Um, there's no data about people being harmed in all mm -hmm. gender restrooms. But what about all the pastors that are just swapped from church to church? I mean, we have data and facts. We sure do. But that's not important to Trump and his fascist followers. Um, queer people are not hurting anybody. Um, we just want health care. We want to... Um, have control over our bodies. You know, I've, I've marched with Planned Parenthood for reproductive health. Um, and it, it is a really scary time. I had, I had friends that got married immediately because they were afraid that that was going yeah. to be taken away. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I have, I have felt it. The only time I dealt sort of with, with a little bit of of judgment was in the Twin Cities, but again, it, it's not it's not LA, and I'm aware of that. And so, you know, every place is getting better, but there's always, you know, I just don't know why they're so angry. Like, but it's these culture they wars. They want to start, and they want to do these culture wars, and right. culture wars don't. It doesn't balance the budget. It doesn't yeah. it doesn't make us safer from a mil I'm retired military from a, from a, a defense. It's culture wars. And yep. it's, it's it's ridiculous, like you said. You got these. You got uh, uh, the, the Jimmy, uh, not Swagger, um, Falwell Jr. with a threesome with the pool boy, with the pool sure. boy, yeah. and yeah. that was that was Trump's number one. But then he then he disappeared. All this other stuff that you know, but they never want to talk about that. They want to come after the LGBTQ community, which right. is is absolutely ridiculous. It doesn't it doesn't do anything except stir up their base. It doesn't bring in new people because yeah. there's more people accepting of the LGBTQ community than there isn't, but not their yeah. base, not that 30 or 35% that's back behind Trump. Mm -mm. No, I mean, they're, they're taking books out of schools. Yeah. What did the book, did the yep. book hurt you? I yeah. mean, you're using your book as a weapon. Yes. Your book, and you're allowed to read whatever book you want and, and believe what you want, but it is not a weapon. Yeah, it's yeah. What, like, what they do with the Bible? Let me ask you: this. What do you feel is the biggest misconception about the LGBTQ community by hard-headed people, MAGA, and and some other? There's others too. I mean, it's mostly that group, but there's others that are not understanding as they should be. You know, like I said, you don't have to like the lifestyle, but you, you don't you don't treat someone less than. And then some of them hate until they have a member in their family, then they're so understanding, but they weren't understanding before, which I have a problem with that too. But what do you feel is the biggest misconception? Well, first of all, I would say the biggest misconception is that they talk about homosexuality in the Bible. That's the first problem, because the fact that all these people base their feelings on a misprint from the Bible, um, that really tells me all I need to know. Um, any sort of gay agenda, um, yes, we would just like to have healthcare, jobs, and you know, not get killed on the street. Um, but again, these are the same people that think guns are more valuable than children. So, you know, there's I don't know if they're gonna get over it and and you know come to the light. As you mentioned, um, a lot of the people who so strongly hate end up being found in gay bars or yes, having they, their lesbian lovers. Yes. That's yes. what it is. Yes. That's what it is. Yeah. That it's fear. And I think and I think a lot of fear from men around gay men and trans women is they are terrified they will be treated the same way they treat women. Because I, I, I'm, I've never been so terrified to be a woman. I mean, feeling like I need to carry weapons on me. I don't mean people are nuts now, yeah. not being sure if I can wear uh, a pride pin or, um, you know, if I'm going to go to, you know, um, if there's going to be a protest somewhere I'm going, you know, I mean, I, 
that that we're hurting anyone that we're trying anything that you know this is part of some like cons- i mean all of all, they're all misconceptions they're all misconceptions this is just who we are you know i i firmly believe that 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 is just how you're born i don't believe that you know it's a choice i don't you know believe that it's a preference i believe it is just that your identity so for anybody to because again, when you grow up as a kid, you 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 you're born to love, but you learn how to hate, and you're taught how to hate. And if we could somehow get to that childlike equality and equity, where we're just all human beings, because my feeling if 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 you're not hurting me or hurting anyone I love, you can do whatever you want. That's okay. You're not hurting me. You're not hurting anyone I love. No gay people that I know. No trans people that I know would hurt a fly. They just want to, we just want to like, it's, it's not like, oh, we, you know, for me, it's like, oh, I want to, you know, have to come out and then there's a huge parade. I'd rather not have to come out. Yeah. You know, I'd rather, you know, it, it, colleges don't have to be ranked by the safest for the queer community. It should just be, it's the safest school. Right. I agree. You know, it, it's like all of these, you know, it's just, it's, it's all misconceptions in my mind. And like you said, until they finally accept their sexuality or their kid is gay. I mean, I am, I fear more for those politicians, children that are queer. Like Ted that Cruz. Fear, Ted Cruz's daughter is a lesbian. Yeah. And he's, and he, look at how he attacks the community. They don't I care. understand it. I, I, yeah, I, I agree. No. Let me ask you this. I know it's a small percentage of the LGBTQ community who support Trump, which is pitiful to me because he does not care about them. What goes through your mind when you see someone like Kate, Caitlyn Jenner not only kissing Trump's ass, but attacking her own community? And I never, you know, I, I tell people on, I'm on the left, look, don't do that Bruce Jenner stuff on my tweets. Don't call him him. I will call yeah. Caitlyn she. Fine. Yes. I don't respect her. I don't like her. <laughs> I, I despise her. She's a rotten human being. But I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. But when you see someone like Caitlyn Jenner, who was Bruce Jenner at one time, now mm-hmm. she identifies as a woman. Again. Fine. Doesn't bother me one bit. But is doubling down on Trump, attacking the LGBTQ community, and the, the very small percentage that do, gay, uh, I think I think there's a Republican, gay Republicans or Republic law cabinet or something. I'm like, I don't even understand it. But when you see that small group, it's just like what the African-American community, I call them out to, the Candace Owens and people like that. When these people are racist, what goes through your mind when you see like a Caitlyn Jenner doing what she's doing? The privilege is disgusting. Caitlyn Jenner has the resources for to look however she wants, to do whatever she wants, and to say whatever she wants. So to completely disregard everyone who has paved the way for you to kiss Trump's ass is, it's hard to even find a word for it, frankly, Um, because that's not somebody who cares. And And when you have that kind of a platform and you choose to partner up with you know, the leader of the gay hate club and the black hate hate club and the anybody else besides Christian, yep. straight white people who are wealthy, because those those kids will be protected from the guns. They will be protected from the hate. They will be protected from all of it. They're always going to be fine. But, you know, even even as a Caucasian person, when, you know, if I'm trying to get health care or deal with things with my insurance and I'm very privileged and all I think is like, there's hundreds of thousands of other people. Like, how are they supposed to get health care when it's so hard for someone like me that should have the immediate access, the immediate resources and everything? So Caitlyn Jenner is a disappointment. Um, again, to have that much of a platform and to really make hate your platform I don't really know how Caitlyn Jenner looks in the mirror every morning. That's a struggle for me because um, she had she has the opportunity and had the opportunity as, you know, I mean, there's more and more even pop artists coming out that are gay, which is awesome. You know, like 
why didn't he's like, you know, Fletcher and Haley Kiyoko and all these, you know, and now there's, you know, pop videos where, you know, they're going to prom with a girl and it's like, okay, fine. Who is this hurting? How, Nobody. how is this? What, Nobody. I, it's like, did I do, we're just trying to make art for other queer kids because the thing is, and again, oh, there's everybody's gay now. No, we're not all dying from AIDS. So we're living longer and you want all this technology to keep us living forever. So we're here now and kids are seeing more representation. So what more of a shame that in when it's supposed to be, you know, an acceptable place, um, I, I'm very sad for the, I mean, I'm sad for my generation because I think millennials really got a tough card, dealt tough cards, but, um, you know, for everybody else, because I see what they're, they're doing to the education. I see what they're doing to diversity. Um, you know, it's just, um, I think that she will have a lot of regrets. I think she will regret this moment. Okay. The final question on that talking point I want to ask you, and I want to do, I want to do the flip side. What do you feel the LGBTQ community could do better in educating people who are confused about pronouns, labels, or anything else that need to be educated on to be a better ally by being educated by the community that they they don't understand, but they want to be an ally. Flip side, what could the LGBTQ community do better in educating that person? Um, well, first I would say the only difference between you and I is who we're attracted to. That's it. That's really the only difference. Aside from that, we're just two people talking. You know, when it comes to the pronouns and everything, which again is such a hot topic, you know, I say to somebody, um, if somebody left a book at the park, what would you say? Oh, um, I wonder if they left it here. That's it. You, you right. just use pronouns. You don't know right. if it's a male or a female that left the book. Right. You know, it's so, oh, it's not grammatically correct. It's not this, whatever. Um, I think, you know, the golden rule of, of treating other people the way you want to be treated. I think it's treat other way, treat people the way they want to be treated. You know, we're just trying to live our lives, have jobs, pay the bills. You know, um, we shouldn't have to be constantly explaining, justifying, protesting, all of these things. And which, again, I mean, there's also so many more oppressed groups that deal with things on a completely different level. And so I can only speak from my lived experience. Um, but, you know, I think when I talk to them about their children or, or kids in their life, that helps to open up because I understand maybe you don't know a trans person. I understand maybe you don't know a gay person. First, again, my response is, I bet you do, but they didn't feel safe enough to tell you. But now it's like, these kids are going to be in the schools and it may be your kid. And don't you want your kid to come and talk to you? And that's my other thing. If there's even a chance <laughs> that you will not accept your child for any reason, you do not deserve to be a parent. That is the other thing I will say. I do not, and I will never, ever, ever understand people who call themselves parents. None of us ask to be in this world. We are here now. You know, we didn't say, ooh, I wanna be, you know, I wanna have this and I have, like, we're here now. So, you know, for, especially if it's because of, of who somebody loves or, or who they are, whether, you know, whether they're neurodivergent, whether they're queer, whether they have depression, like anything that would have you kick this thing that you brought into the world with, with your DNA or you adopted surrogate, however, um, you're not a parent that is not supportive because there are so many statistics about younger queer and trans kids if they have a supportive adult in their life the suicide rates are significantly lower and equal to that of straight young people right because at least they have the support and they you know whereas when they have no support 
what what they think they have nothing to live for. So, um, you know, we just keep showing love. We keep going high and they keep going low. And I think for artists to start coming out as queer, for um, CEOs and things like that to be out, it helps young kids see that that's a possibility, you know? And um, I, I hope one day it's not such a big deal, but unfortunately because of the men and some women in power, um, it seems like the biggest problem, which is wild considering the, the true problems this country and this world are facing aside from people just wanting to be themselves. Okay. I want to ask you one political question. We've talked a little bit of politics, but one political question, and it's the flip, flip side. If Trump wins in November, and I'm doing everything I can, and everybody's doing everything they can, but it is a possibility that he could win. Yeah. It's insane that I'm even saying that, but it's the truth. Um, what do you think happens to America? I think if we thought it was bad before, I, I think it could be worse. I think the power and the ego. I mean, it's just like these people, like rules, science, facts, data is like nothing to them. Like it, it does not matter anything he's done that, I mean, and, and it's a laundry list. Oh, I yeah. mean, we're not, but it's like, oh, but the emails. Okay. How about this, you know, or this, or, um, you know, I, I am nervous because, you know, even right now, I have colleagues that are finding ways to move out of Florida, out of Oklahoma, things like that, because there are at least safe havens. My fear is that there will be, there will be no safe havens. And he is very influential and he's great at teaching people how to hate based on nothing because he's a businessman and he's an influencer. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm really just afraid for children. I think what they're trying to do is get kids out of schools. I think they want to make it scary and lacking in education so that everyone has to keep them home and they're just going to teach them what they want and, you know, have their robots move on. So I think that if Trump wins, we are going to have to get louder. And we're going to have to, that's it. We're going to have to get louder because he's very loud and his minions are very loud. And we are too, but we don't have that platform, you know, and um, it's not about a fight, right? We don't want to fight because we don't want to stoop to that level. But um, gosh, I don't know. I'm, I'm scared. I am scared if that happens. Okay. A little lighter note. Fun fact, something we both share. Deb and I have a rescue dog named Santino Corleone Berkwood, which he's Santino after the Godfather, of course. Oh, I love it. And you had this handsome little lad I'm about to show a picture of, bow tie wearing rescue dog Milo. We probably want to show it. That's my books. Milo. Okay. So we both, we both that. A lot of people that follow me um, do rescues instead of, yes. you know, they say, you know, don't, don't go to a pet store, do a rescue. It's a better thing. So talk about Milo, talk about rescuing him. Absolutely. So um, in, ter uh, in regards to rescuing, es especially being in LA now, the, the shelters are so overwhelmed. There are so many dogs in each cage. There's like a hundred dogs to one staff. It's just, they can't even keep up. And this comes from the breeders. This comes from the COVID puppies. This comes from, oh, I want it because it's cute and now I have no use for it. Or, um, you know, now I'm moving. I mean, you see, I mean, you see people that, you know, they've had dogs for eight years and then they drop them off. And again, it's kind of the same thing like I, that I feel with parents. If you're not going to love that dog unconditionally until it takes its last breath, you should not be a pet parent. It's not a toy. It's a living, breathing thing that has value and worth and deserves to be loved and have a family. So, um, you know, 
And also what it's such a gift knowing that you're giving this loving thing another chance. I think we're all so lucky to be able to have dogs in our lives. They're just, um, dogs have always saved me. I got a dog when I was 15 and really struggling with my mental health and she completely saved me. And, you know, when I was here and it was COVID and we were all kind of locked in and I was just feeling confused and, um, you know, and I saw Milo and, and he just saved me and, and, you know, because it's just, you know, I know for him specifically, he was in an apartment hoarding situation. I don't know the specifics. Um, but you know, for about six months, every time he would finish his bowl of food, he would take it and carry it with him because mm. I could see the fear that he was not going to get fed again or things like that. So, um, you know, I guess sort of, you know, on, on one hand, it's, I love seeing, watching him calm down and, you know, going to the dog park and playing with the other, you know, dogs and things like that. And just seeing the effects that breeding is having. I mean, dogs are being euthanized. That's it. And it's not the shelter's fault, but they, they can't, there's not enough resources. And, um, you know, so I just, highly 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 recommend rescue there's so many dogs out there that need rescuing um there's the perfect dog out there for you and there's it's just it's not going to stop until the breeding stops so we have to we have to move the pendulum the other way so that these dogs can live beautiful lives that they deserve regardless of i mean just humans are the worst and animals are better <laughs> you're so. telling me i, I, I like, tell them all the time if, if people could be it. If people could be half of what Santino is, it'd be a beautiful world. Yes. And anyway, if there is a heaven, dogs all need to go there. All of them. Yes. Every last one of them. Yes. Every last yes. one of them. Okay. Yes. And um, somebody's going to ask me, what is this breed? So go ahead and tell, tell the viewers what his breed is. So when I first got him, I was told he was a one-year-old puggle. And, and then um, I decided to do the DNA test because everyone kept saying, he's a little pug. Um, and it turns out he's primarily Chihuahua. He has a little bit of Japanese chin and then a lot of other things in his background. But he's got a little curly tail, which made us think that, you know, maybe he was uh, a pug and then a nice little underbite. So he's got a nice Elvis snarl going on. <laughs> always, always in his bow tie. He's always very bow tie. He's a classic yeah. little And how old is he? He is actually three. He's okay. actually three. We found out he was three. He okay. was just so tiny when I got him. So, you know, and and understandably, they don't always know the, the full history. But um, he's just a love. I'm so lucky. Okay. On, on that note, before we segue into the second half of the 360 conversation, the fun random questions, we're going to take a short commercial break. Folks, this is Bad Brad Berkwood, the host of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report Web TV channel. And I want to talk to you about sponsorship. If you're interested in being a sponsor on the Bad Brad Berkwood Show that features network guests and entertainers and people from all walks of life in business and other areas, reach out to me at ringsidereport2014 at gmail.com. Again, that's ringside report 2014 at gmail.com. I'm finally in a position that I'm ready to take on sponsors. So, hey, reach out to me and let's get you on board. I want to talk to you about my book, Boxing Interviews of a Lifetime. If you watch my show, The Bad Brad Berkwood Show, you know that I love doing 360 conversations with all types of people. Well, I made my bones in boxing over a quarter of a century ago, interviewing world champion boxers, people in the sport, and entertainers that love the sport of boxing, which led to my induction into the Florida Boxing Hall of Fame in June of 2021. And that's the ring that you see me wear all the time on my show. Well, if you like to pick up my book, Boxing Interviews of a Lifetime, go to authorhouse.com. Again, it's authorhouse.com. And if you would like to get it personally inscribed or inscribed for somebody that you're sending it to as a gift, you can reach out to me and we can arrange 
for something uh, as well. All right, we're now back, Hannah. You ready? These are just rapid questions. There's no right Let's or wrong answer. Whatever comes in your head, that's the right answer. Love it. What is your favorite genre of movies? I would say comedies and documentaries. Okay. What is a movie you could put in and watch it over and over again, never gets old? Um, I would, I'm going to steal this from my mom, Notting Hill. We're big Notting Hill people. It's okay. just simple, you know. Okay. Good choice. Do you have a favorite or a TV show that you really, really like, but you never missed an episode of it? The Office. The Office. Okay. With Steve Carell? Oh, yes. I'm yeah. a big, everybody who knows me knows I'm a, that's my comfort show. So I think I've, I watch it through about three times a year. Okay. <laughs> Off the top of your head, first thought that comes of most memorable child or one of your most memorable childhood memories that pops in your head. Um, I, that's a great question. I, you know what, honestly, I would say my, my favorite memories when I was a kid, my mom used to do something called the colors of Christmas tour every year with other people. And I think that was the first time I actually sang that, that I think Peebo handed me a microphone, um, and, and Peebo, sang, Peebo but, Bryson? You know, just, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, watching my mom, those are, those are my favorite memories. Okay. Good, great one. Do you have a favorite noise or sound you like to hear? Um, my niece and my dog. Okay. When my when my when Milo's dreaming, and then pretty much any sound my niece makes, she doesn't make a lot of them yet. She's only a little bit over one year old, so really any sound she makes is my favorite sound. Anybody laughing? Okay. Now flip that. Least yes. favorite noise or sound? Oh, gosh. Um, chalk. Chalk on a board. Just all the chalk, the chalk, the chalk, the chalk. Yes, that's... Okay, I don't so, like it. And I don't, and I don't like the, the sound of Trump's voice. I, I, I had a feeling you were going to say Trump's voice first. But okay, so let's go back to the chalk for a minute. You yeah. ever have to clean your board because you, the teacher said, okay, you were, you were talking when you shouldn't, or you didn't raise your hand, you had to go clean the chalkboard? No, you know, I I was a pretty nerdy kid, and I wanted okay. to be the teacher's pet. So no, it never happened. Okay, I no. I, I can relate because I had to do it a couple of times. My big my New York boy, uh, your attitude sometimes got me in trouble. Okay, I got gotcha. you. What do you have a favorite food that you enjoy? Sushi. So, your mom said the same thing. You know that oh, right? we're big again. You know, I I can't remember not eating sushi. You know, and and I, but I remember, I'll never get over this. I was, when I was working in Minneapolis and we were right across the street from Target. So somebody bought sushi from Target. Okay, they may not know better. That's fine. Then they took the fork and picked it up. And, and I was like, okay, so it's not normal. You know, not all kids learn how to use, I think I was probably five or six when I learned how to use chopsticks. So we've all been, we a big sushi family. Any Asian food, really. Okay. And since I remember your mom's 360 comment, I can't believe it's going to be four years this year that we did our first conversation, but I remember saying sushi, but then I said to her, I had a, I didn't think she was going to say sushi. So I said, okay, go back to New York. And if oh. you're in New York, now let's get you back in New York when you go back to the East Coast and you see your relatives. What's your favorite food that you're going to get there in New York? Italian, baby. Okay. Same thing with Boston. If I go, you know, I'm going to go to Little Italy and I'm getting some some chicken parm i'm getting some cannolis um getting all of it okay all, stuff. all right what is the first job on the books or off the books you ever had i sold popcorn at universal studios okay no that was my first job okay cool all right where is your favorite vacation destination Everyone kind of makes fun of me about this because I've really been to a lot of wonderful places. But 
about 40 minutes north of LA, there's a little town called Oxnard, California. And oh, we yeah. grew up, yeah, we grew up our summers going to that beach. And so that's, that's where I feel most calm. And that's my favorite place. Okay. To go. Just if I was taking a flight, I'd say Australia, but okay. if I'm keeping it local, I'm going to Oxnard. Okay. So let me ask you this because your mom gave me an answer that no one ever gave before. And, and I'd like to say I got a photographic memory. She talked about somewhere in Alaska, which is kind of like, I forget where she said, where she goes. Sitka. What Sitka. is it called? Right. Sitka, Have you ever yes. been there with her? Have you ever gone? No. You know, that um, that's my bucket list place is Alaska because I do love the snow. Uh, I was in the, the Midwest when she went on that trip and I'm very jealous, but I can't wait to go there. I love all the, I watch all the Alaska shows. It's okay. fascinating to me. Okay. Yeah. So if you could meet one person in history, dead or alive, from any walk of life, who would you like to meet? And what would either be a question or some things you would like to talk to that individual that you choose? Can I have a dinner party? Sure. Can I have a table? Okay. Um, I think if I could have anybody, I would I would love to meet Harvey Milk. I would love for Amy Winehouse to be there because I have a lot of questions about her. And uh, aside from my mom, she was, you know, one of my sort of biggest vocal inspirations. Um, oh, there's so many. And my grandma, just the three of us. Your mom or your dad's mom? <laughs> my mom's mom, Ruthie. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We talked about her and in, in, in that she was she was in the uh, garment industry, correct? That's a uh, fashion designer. Fine, fashion right, designer. right, right. Yeah, my designer. family, right. it's it's matriarchy. You know, we got my my grandma and then she had two daughters and my mom had me and my aunt has two daughters. So it's all, it's all the women. And again, I thought that was normal until I moved away and was like, I thought the women were the breadwinners. That's just, you know, what, so, yeah. Okay. I'm going to send you, since you mentioned milk, your mom knows this. Yeah. Got a clip. I know you're not on Twitter. I'm going to send you, I'll text on the phone to you, send you a clip. Yeah. My dad took on Anita Bryant for the gay community. In yeah. the 70s, there was an NBC Nightly News special and he was on it. But what they did was they took a piece. If you saw the movie Milk with Sean Penn, you actually yes. saw my dad. Yes. There's public footage in there. It's it's Ronald Reagan. It was Jerry Brown, Ronald Reagan, my father, and then somebody else afterwards. I'm going to send it to you. But they yes, they please. used it in the movie Milk. And it's, you know, it's, it's, his, it's his legacy, which... When I found out, I was in tears. And when I, someone actually called me from the West Coast and said, I think your dad's in that movie. Like, How can he be in that movie? He died in 1998. It was public footage that they used. And I got in touch with the guy that put it in there. And he said he was happy because that was the most compelling. Yeah, you'll see it when I said it to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. And and you know, they just named, you know, I'm retired Navy. They just named a ship after Harvey Milk. I don't know if you saw that. No, I didn't. That's I'll, awesome. I'll you, well, that's you, yeah, I'll send you, know? you a link. Yeah. Yep, I'll send you a link. Okay, with everything we discussed today and a few thoughts, Hannah, how would you sum yourself up as a human being? Um, I, what would I say about myself as a human being? Um, I would say I'm a deep thinker um, with, ridiculous amounts of love to give <laughs> so yeah i'm always i've always been a thinker and a lover okay although i have to my mom says i'm a carrier of light and i like that one i haven't figured like, it out yet but she always says i'm a, that i'm a carrier of light well this show is about you that's why i only mentioned you, mom, you know <laughs> thank it's, you thank it's you about yes, you to yes. shine because i didn't want you to think this is a show because of your mom it's a show about you this is your 360 conversation but Adoring your mom like I do, I, I'm going to tell you this now on camera. She is extremely proud of you. And I mean that. Very, very proud of you. And I told her this, and I don't pull any punches. She's a mensch. She's, she, yes. Besides for all the success she had in the music industry, she is one of those people that is, she walks the walk. She talks the talk. Yes. I told her about her videos. I love how her videos have the LGBTQ. They have inter, I'm in an interracial relationship. She has that. She has yep. what America looks like, and I admire her for that. But what I want to do is ask you, to, I know you're not really on social media that much, 
But if someone that's looking for you that might want to interact with you, um, I, I believe you're on, are you on LinkedIn? Is that it? Yeah, LinkedIn, I, I mostly use primarily. Um, so yeah, I would say reach out to me there. You can send me a message on LinkedIn. Okay, on LinkedIn. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close out with some thoughts and I'm going to give you back the microphone. You close out whatever you want. First of all, again, Anna, thank you for coming on today. I greatly appreciate it. As I, I told your mom, and the same applies to you, when she was telling me about you and I was looking at your bio and doing research, I'm going to use a Yiddish word for my viewers. You're a mensch. You define the word mensch, and, and I appreciate that because you're using your your voice, your platforms, your whether you train at your, your job, whatever you do, to move humanity forward. Because as much as democracy is in trouble in the United States of America, so is humanity. And Trump... Yes. And his cronies and that MAGA cult are a threat equally to humanity as they are democracy. And that's what this show is about, moving humanity forward. So thank you for using your voice. I know it's not always easy. I hate the fact that you have to explain yourself. You should. You're a human being first. I don't care about your sexuality. I don't. I don't care about your color. I don't care right. about your gender or your pronouns. Do I understand everything? No, I don't. But what I look at you first is a human being. And thank we you. have... And if they would understand that we really have more in common that unites us than divides us, but it's exactly. that fucking, it's that hatred that they yes. have. And yes. That's the problem. So thank you for speaking out on the show about that, going into detail about that. I appreciate it. You have access to me now. If you have somebody else that wants to come on, just all you got to do is text me and say, hey, Brad, I got so-and-so. And they don't have to be somebody famous. They can be somebody in the LGBTQ community. They don't have to be an LGBTQ community. If they have something, they're moving humanity forward or fighting for democracy, you get them in touch with me. I want to tell their story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I love all the stuff that you're doing. So thank you for you're quite welcome. Me to, yeah. You're quite welcome. With that said, I want to give you back the mic. You close out with anything you want. I would say for um anybody out there who's uh watching, listening, maybe struggling, um, I can't promise that it gets better, but what I do to tell people is that it gets different. So how you're feeling right now is not going to be the same how you feel in a year, in two years, in five years, in 10 years. I don't know if it's going to get easier. I don't know if it's going to get better, but it will not be the same as it is right now. And let that give you some hope to just hang on because I know what it feels like and have been there when you wonder, is there a future for me? Is there what, what is left? And really think and really feeling that maybe there isn't anything. But um, if if you have breath, you have hope. And if you have time, you have opportunity. We don't know what's going to happen to us tomorrow, but just be patient, be gentle with yourself, and be as loud as you have to be. You know, or or be quiet. Whatever feels right for you, but just keep working to be yourself because you will find it eventually. And I'm still working on that. Okay. That's a great way to close out. Again, thanks for coming on Hannah. Like I said, do not be shy. You can text me <laughs> any, anytime you want. I always, thank respond. you. If you have somebody who wants to tell their story, I want it. I want people to hear their stories because these, these are the type of shows that I enjoy doing the most. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely think about it. I'm sure I can think of some great people. Okay. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Give is he there? Is, is Milo right there next to you? Milo. Let me. Can you put him on camera? Yeah. Let me go. Let me go get him. Okay. Santino. Come here, Santino. Hey, folks, this is live. I'm still shooting. Dantino! <laughs> is, he, is he coming there down? Are. There he is. A hey, handsome fella. The, the cameo with the bow tie. <laughs> Sorry to wake you up from your nap, sir. Oh, handsome. This is Milo. Hey, Milo. Now, is he, is, is he named? He's not named after the movie, is he? Milo and Otis? No, that was, yeah, no, that was the name he was given, and I sort of felt like it fit, so. Okay. He's Santa Milo. <laughs> hold, on, hold on one second. I don't usually do this, but they say, oh, you can't go off camera. I'm going off camera. Hold on one second. Yeah, go get it. I want something to say yeah. a little while. Come here, Santino. Yeah. Santino. Say hi to a puppy. Say hi to a puppy. You wagging your tail. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you see another puppy? Can you see another puppy? There he is. Hey, Santa, ah. say hello to my. Say hi. <laughs> no, look, look at the camera. Look, look. Look, 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 look. look you're looking around. I know. I know. I know you, you get paid personal appearance fees. I know. Thank you. Oh, tough. Tough. Look, look, look. look. look here's oh, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do the follow up with puppies. Exactly. We'll, we'll have them. Santino's a ham, anyways. He loves to be on the camera, believe it or not. Yeah. I always got to tell him. All right. Well, hey, enjoy the rest of your day. And again, thank you, you have so access much. to it. You, thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for all that you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye.